Hello, everyone, and welcome to Herod TV. My name is Lale Hancock, and I am one of the board advisors. And today, I have a special guest for us, someone from my hometown of America, because we tend to interview people from all around the world. And she's in, is it Chicago? Actually, Minneapolis. Minneapolis, see, next door neighbor. Well, um, as you could tell, my beautiful friends, uh, Kelly Stecker is here. Hello, Kelly. Hi, thanks for having me. Oh my gosh. So we have a best-selling author. We have someone who is one of the best OBGYNs, which is the obstetrics gynecology doctors on the planet. She um, has done a lot of amazing things with the communities and empowering people beyond their disabilities and everything else. And we're gonna talk about a lot of that today. So Kelly, I'm so, so grateful that you're here today. I'm so thankful we get to have a little chat, even though you're a much more fun place than I am. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. And I have to say, it's been sunny every day here in the last week and a half. Um, and um, yeah, how can I, yeah. It's amazing, I mean, but yeah. you know, today, <laughs> well, yes, it is a little colder in Minneapolis, isn't it? <laughs> it is little, but that's okay. Just a Up little, just a little bit. Well, you know, Kelly, I'd like the whole world to know about you and all the things you've done, but some of these amazing things that you're actually currently working on. So can you give a little snapshot of Kelly and, you know, maybe growing up, what was it that inspired you to actually become an OBGYN? Oh, sure. Um, we're reaching back in the long, long history of the world, but um, so there you go. So I actually grew up in Wisconsin. So again, you know, neighbor to Chicago and Minnesota and everything else. And when I was growing up, I actually thought I was going to be a pediatrician, right? Because I, I know I liked working with kids. I uh, volunteered at uh, basically a program for kids to combat obesity, right? Because as we know, that's a huge issue that we all face. And so I was working with that and I loved my pediatric rotation. However, when I did my rotations in medical school, I did my OBGYN, my obstetrics and gynecology rotation. And I wanted to hate it because everyone tells you the lifestyle is not great. However, the first time I did a delivery, that was it. Like I just knew it was for me and I loved working with women and I loved women's health. And I just thought it was pretty darn amazing to be able to be part of someone's family for these deliveries. Cause you really do, especially yeah. when you're in practice and you see your own patients and you do your own deliveries, when you get to be part of their family and this experience, that's a big deal. And then they come back to you for their other deliveries. You figure out kind of what's going on with their family and their kids. And it just really is a lovely um, way to live your life. And then you also get to be there for them during, you know, depression stuff, because so many of us have had anxiety and depression, especially with the pandemic and the postpartum period is particularly challenging. And so the studies show that the rates are significantly higher than they were before. And so you get to be there to support them and help them through that and help them through menopause and hormonal changes and, you know, all kinds of stuff. And I think that that really gives me a lot of personal satisfaction. Wow. You know, it's interesting because I was supposed to be a pediatrician too. And there's something about pediatrics that pulls you in. But then, like you said, then you get to really explore and see like, because it is, I mean, pediatrics couldn't happen without OBGYN. Yeah, <laughs> you know? I, I loved pediatrics. There's just something a little more. I, so I realized that I probably should be an OBGYN when I was paying more attention to the ultrasounds, right? So I rotated with a pediatric cardiologist. And so we did a lot of uh, fetal ultrasounds to look at yeah. heart defects in the office. And so that part to me became more interesting than the taking care of the baby part. And so I realized, yeah, okay, I think this is where my heart is at, right? So it was an interesting dynamic for me to realize that. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, we're very grateful. And I'm sure our every single patient you've ever worked with <laughs> that you went down this road. Um, you know, one of the things that you were telling me is about this book. So can you talk a little bit more about delivery? Yeah. So I wrote a book called Delivering. This was another one of my um, COVID projects, I guess we'll say. I think probably all of us have those. And when I when I wanted to write this, I wanted to write something that was open and real and vulnerable about my life and challenges that I've gone through, because I think that women feel really alone with some of the challenges that they face. And we don't talk about things enough, right? So in my book, I talk about assault and I talk about domestic violence and I talk about healthcare issues and being a woman in medicine and going through training and all those sorts of things. And I think trying to open up and have these conversations is really important because unfortunately medicine is kind of a culture of silence still, right? If you come forward and you say, oh my gosh, I was harassed or I was whatever happened in the workplace, that you're seen as weak, that you couldn't handle it. You couldn't fall in line. You couldn't follow the hierarchy. And in a lot of ways you become retaliated against. And so I wanted to do my part to try to enter into this culture so that we can try to make some permanent changes. But on the other side, I wanted to make sure that people didn't feel alone with some of these women's health issues that we all go through. Right. I mean, I, I talk about, um, one of my patient stories, and thankfully I haven't had this experience myself, but she lost a child, right? And so I talk about that from my perspective and being her physician. And I think it's really important for us to have these dialogues so that we don't feel isolated, which I think COVID really made a lot of us feel isolated. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. It didn't matter who you were all of us were affected by COVID, you know? And um, I was actually talking in a different group with a bunch of executives, because it's not just in the medical field, like there's so many fields where it's just not acceptable to talk about mental well-being, you know? And that, you know, that, you know, so many of them had anxiety and not just stress, but they actually had panic attacks. And I know, for most, the first response is here's some pills, take some pills, you know, but it's not always that sometimes really someone just needs someone to talk to or someone needs an alternative technique to assist them in being able to handle all that information and the energies and everything that's going on in their world. So I'm so grateful for this book that you put out there and what a futurist you are, you know, putting that book <laughs> out there because Imagine like how many people didn't even know they needed your book and then now they do, you know? Yeah, I, I mean, I really felt like, you know, we were all just kind of pulled apart with COVID even more than we ever had been before. And we're all in our own little silos, which is a reason why we have a lot of the issues we have, right? Because we're not engaging with each other. We're not having open communication. And I think the more we can focus on connection, the better teams we're going to have, the better caring partnerships we're going to have, because I, I see this all the time in healthcare, right? And you have like this, this distinct hierarchy and you've got the bosses and you've got the administration and everything else. And wouldn't that be nice if maybe administration actually cared and took time to understand some of the pressures and the challenges that the physicians and the nurses were going through? Maybe that would make you feel valued. Maybe that would make you feel less burned out and want to stay in your career. Because when we look at the statistics, we're really in a significant hardship in healthcare in terms of nursing and physicians and staffing in general. And there was just a survey that came out that is estimating maybe even up to 75% of healthcare workers will be leaving by 2025. And so if you look at that in context of how we typically do things in the status quo, we have a long way to go to change that because we've got these individuals who unfortunately have a lot of times been put into power, not because of their merit, but because of who they know, or they were just there and they were promoted or whatever the case may be. And they're not invested in the people that they're leading. And I think that that is really un unfortunate because then we have this significant shortage. And I don't think that that's going to get any better unless we can take ownership. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's so true. I mean, I remember I used to um, be an executive at a not-for-profit and um, we worked with a lot of nurses and we worked with a lot of 
other hospitals. And it was amazing, the shortage of nurses. And then you would think, okay, if there's shortage of nurses, there's gonna be more nursing programs that make the next generation wanna be nurses. And when my kids were in college, I was shocked. Their best friend wanted to be a nurse and there's a shortage, but yet there's still 40 spots in one school. You know what I mean? Like it, so it really is that we have to look at what is this future that we actually would like to create and what do we need to put in place today to be able to actually achieve that? And the medical field is one of those key fields that needs to be able to be progressive and grow with the changes that are happening. And like you said, you know, a lot of times they're not looking at it that way. They're also not looking at engaging the physicians, the nurses, and allowing them to feel valued mm -hmm. and their thoughts, their, their ideas be valued. You know, I don't believe in like, let's just come complain and then let's just walk away because that's just throwing the hot potato. Exactly. But yes, these are the problems, but what ideas do we have? You mm -hmm. know, what, what, what other solutions do we have that haven't even been considered? So, yeah. Well, we've got, we've got a lot of amazing things out there now. I mean, we even have, um, I have a really good friend, colleague, Raj, who started an entire wellness program app that I'm an advisor on, which is amazing. And we're also going to be using artificial intelligence for these things. And I started an organization called Patient Care Heroes to help our entire healthcare squad get mental health resources. Because the other issue we see is people being afraid to seek mental health resources. So in the United States, and when I talk to people in other countries about this, they think it's wild. But in the United States, um, people can actually have license ramifications if they seek mental health resources. So Minnesota, where I am, used to be one of the states that had language in their physician license application that was discriminatory based on the Americans with Disabilities Act. We just recently, as of September, were able to change some of that language, but it's still not perfect, right? And so we're trying to work toward getting national governmental oversight for these licensing regulations because everyone should be able to seek resources if they need to without fear of ramifications. We also need to have improved accessibility. And some of that's starting to manifest now. There's improved license situations where people from other states can help individuals from other states, right? Because there's that whole issue where if I'm in Minnesota, can I take care of someone in Texas, right? There's that whole um, yeah. medical licensing issue that we have. So we're working on some of those challenges and we also need to make it cost effective and easily accessible in that respect as well. So when I started my career, I was a CNA. Okay. So I was a certified nursing assistant. So you make minimum wage and I made minimum wage in Wisconsin. Do you think that one dime of that would have gone to mental health resources? No, because you're trying to survive and save and fund your schooling or whatever it is that you want to do in your career. And so those individuals also saw a lot of trauma, especially during the pandemic. It's often medical assistants and CNAs that were the ones that were taking care of bodies, right? And so we need to make sure that we're not overlooking individuals, individuals who did a lot of the work. Yeah. And thank you for this. Thank you for this organization that you've created because it is about empowering people. And not just empowering, you know, like I think a lot of times we go to like, oh, let's empower this group mm -hmm. instead of it's this whole big umbrella that needs to be covered. And thank you so much for doing that. That's incredible. Now, you you, help. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everyone needs something, right? I mean, yeah. I think uh, if you don't openly admit you need something, then you're probably hiding it, right? Because everyone needs somebody in their corner. That's the biggest thing. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of times we don't know that, you know, who can have our back. And like you said, the fear of speaking out. Um, I do these programs called Right Voice for You, and it really is empowering people to know they can have a voice and that, you know, having a voice doesn't mean that your life ends, um, but there might be some twists, you know, some things that get shifted, but sometimes you speaking up and no matter what the ramifications are, it creates change. You know, it's going to bubble up things that people haven't been willing to talk about. And sometimes being that leader and being the one who speaks, it's amazing. We, we, we hit the hard times, but we, the, the road we're paving is way beyond any of those discomforts of what 
is in front of us today. So thank you so much for bringing a voice to the medical industry, you know, and to women, children, to men, to, to um, medical um, workers all around to have a voice and be able to know that they're not alone. You know, we all need to know we're not alone. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's, I mean, I think the probably the biggest thing we all need is just the support. And yeah. my goal is to make sure that people don't feel like they're in these situations by themselves, because as we know, physician suicide and nursing suicide, those rates were high before the pandemic, and now they're even higher. And the last thing I would want is me not to have taken action or put myself out there or said something and have someone die because they, they felt like they were alone in these issues. Yeah, definitely. And they do. I mean, like, think about it. The nurses are the ones who deal with the panicked patients that come in, the fear that they have. So they're dealing with everyone's fear, trying to calm everyone down and then doing all that they have to do to communicate and collaborate with doctors. You know, there, it is a very high stress environment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we talk about well being, and I actually go traveling around the world, working with um, medical healthcare people, as well as communities to know that there are other options available too. Um, Cause when you hold it in after a while, that's a lot to hold in. Yeah, I mean, and you know? that's why you Kelly, see out and, and the physical ramifications of it, right? And so what you're doing is so critical because we need to be able to heal from the inside out. Exactly, Kelly, we met because of Hera. You know, this incredible organization. We are building a city in a country. I don't know if anybody else on the planet can say those words out loud. <laughs> um, you know? <laughs> no, no, but I'm on my way. <laughs> Um, it really is about empowering humanity for all of us to know we're not alone to empower, but really to teach to fish and not just be like, here, come, I'm going to take care of you. You know, it really is bringing awareness, bringing resources and empowering people to stand up on their own two feet and be able to become entrepreneurs, be able to become business owners, be able to really have the wellness, the well-being resources and so much more. So I'm just curious, you know, what would be your your advice or your recommendation or anything looking at Hera, you know, in the next five years, like, what, what do you get? It would look like. Oh my gosh. I mean, there's so many things I think, well, everyone has a story, right. And, and I think that we need to do a lot better job listening and hearing and everything else. I would love to empower more people to write because I think writing is so healing. And I know that when I wrote my book, that was really kind of a healing journey for me as well as hoping to help somebody else who might need a little boost, right? And so I think we need to empower people to write and own their story. We need to help people be empowered to use their voice, right? Because so many people are afraid to say something, right? And, and you know my situation, obviously, but sometimes speaking out, even if it's the right thing to do, can get you fired, right? And so in my situation, doing the right thing for a patient and speaking out against something that was not appropriate for her, um, while legally I was doing the right thing, it was going against a health system, right? And so then they want you silenced. And so I think we need to empower people to be open and to use their voices because if more people were, then maybe people like me wouldn't be standing alone in this situation. Maybe we'd have like a whole resource of people that would stand up and say, okay, this is not right. We don't have to have a culture of silence in medicine. We need to fight and advocate for our patients. And so I think that that really in all industries is a really important issue for people to overcome. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes the whole idea of even having a voice, I work with so many people who can't even communicate with their teenagers, you know, <laughs> they don't have a voice at home. No, but like, he's here, you know, like, well, they're teenagers. Like, what yeah. if having a voice, <laughs> having a voice, what if it's not just about the fight or something like that, but truly like each of us, if we had a voice, like even if we grew up knowing, you know what, you can say anything in the safe space, mm -hmm. just get it oh, off your chest, yeah. you know, and, to own your and then maybe other ideas would come up. 
Yeah, yeah. no, yeah. absolutely. Because a lot of us grew up in homes, I mean, at least I did, where we weren't allowed to have emotions, right? So if we were crying or whatever, our dad was the, I'll give you something to cry about, you know, smack kind of guy, right? So we were taught emotions are bad. Don't talk about your feelings, um, which is something I had to really work on as a parent because I didn't want to be essentially emotionally unavailable for my kids. And I wanted them to know that, their feelings were valid and we can work through those issues, right? So I had to do a lot of unlearning, but that, I mean, it kind of starts when we're children, right? And so the way we grew up and how to handle our voice and our emotions and our everything else, that kind of carries through to adulthood unless we do a lot of unlearning if we're in those environments. So I totally agree. Um, learning to be your authentic self is something that sounds like it should be easy, <laughs> but it is not, especially for people who, have a history of assault or have a history of abuse, or we're basically trained and physically, you know, assaulted potentially if they, if they did have a voice, if they were their authentic self. And so I think working on that issue would be really good for overall wellness, because it's only when you can be the best version of you that you can heal. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, that brings me to kind of my next thing. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that are going to be watching this, you know, we're going to have men, women, children, you know, we're going to have individuals in different industries, like, what's your, um, what would you like to invite other people to, you know, like, you know, if you had some advice to give women today, no matter how old they were, what would it be? It's never too late to find what you're passionate about and just go for it. Right. And, and I think that we see pivoting and changing gears as a failure, at least I used to, right. Because it's like, okay, I picked this path and I'm on this path and I have to own it. Right. That's just kind of like, and, and I think that anyone who's been through medical training feels like they probably can relate to that because you are stuck. You've taken out the loans, you're in your training, you did your residency, like this is it, this is all you got. Right. And it wasn't until you know, I had some personal things happen in COVID and just kind of was like a chaos of life. I realized that I'm more than this one part of my life, right? So I'm not just a doctor. I can't just only provide clinical medicine for people. I can write and I can help teach people and I can do all these things. And I think we really limit ourselves. And so if we can figure out what lights us up, what makes us actually happy, what brings us joy and actually divert and go in that direction, I think we would all be a lot better off. Yeah. And it is, it's interesting that sometimes it takes those difficult moments for us to look outside of what we've defined ourselves to be. I mean, for me, you know, it's so funny. I'm the executive, I'm the mom, I'm the daughter, I'm the wife, you know, all these things. And then really taking away the boxes you are you and all these things are parts of you mm -hmm. and how to not separate you because of the environment you're in while no hey this person needs to hear it this way you know and and it really is that we have to empower each other to know that it's okay to make mistakes mm -hmm. you know it's because sometimes until you do something you really don't know until you chose that so, oh yeah, oh, yeah, that <laughs> yeah. didn't work out the way I thought, you know. Um, and then do it again. But like you said, what if what choice you made to what your career is is one of the many gifts of who you are? Well, and I think it's okay to change, right? What I've realized is maybe yeah. this path was my real path, right? Like a lot of times, like you were in it, you were in love with the situation, you just this was it, right? And maybe in 10 years, this other thing is really it. And this is your passion and your joy. Like it is okay to have different careers, to have different lives, to have different paths, right? And it doesn't make this experience any less valuable, right? And I, I kind of think of love like that, right? Just because maybe a love relationship ended doesn't make it any less valuable. It still was what it was. But maybe this over here is a better, healthier situation for you. So it's the same thing with careers and things that you wanna do with your life. Like you just have to kind of float and give yourself grace and the ability to make these choices. Definitely. I've made many myself. <laughs> many <laughs> <laughs> many <laughs> <laughs> 
but that's the beauty of us, you know, the uniqueness of us and that we have the abilities, but sometimes we don't know until we try it. So mm-hmm. if anything I could share with people, like you said, please try different things, play with it, see if you enjoy it. Like with you, you wrote the book, you have this organization. So now what else, what else can you add to your life that you haven't considered yet? Yeah, well, um, I'm actually trying to work on healthcare for women in rural areas, right? So I want to improve access because my goal is also to decrease maternal mortality because that's a huge catastrophe here in America and black to white women die at a rate of three to one, which is horrible. And so how can we deal with that? So I am looking at starting a different organization that will specifically address some of the rural access needs. And I'm hoping that that will actually kind of propel some innovation because again, pushing from the outside in seems to be a lot more successful from than from the inside out in terms of healthcare systems and growth. So, so grateful you are on the planet and thank you for all that you're doing and being in the world. And I can't wait until there's other things that we'll share with them in terms of your new projects and different things that you're initiating. So thank you so much for being here today, Kelly. And thank you all for watching um, Hera TV. And if you guys have any questions or any topics or anyone you'd like us to interview, please go to harrisity.org. And uh, we, we look forward to seeing all of you in the new Harris City soon. It will take a few years, but we'll see you soon. Thank you, everyone. (laughs) Thanks, Kelly. Thank you.